We'll be in Acts chapter. We'll be in the book of Acts again. We're going to be a little, um, a few different places in Acts this morning as we are going to look at Barnabas um, for this morning's message. But we'll continue in our series here, Finding Power for the Mission. And so if you have your Bible, flip it open, or turn it on, or call up the, the book of Acts, whatever method you're using, <clears throat> whether your phone, tablet, or physical Bible, and let's get ready to be in his word. <clears throat> and we are in chapter 11 of Acts, and we, um, we've come to Antioch. That city is predominantly um, Gentiles, and we see how the gospel is going to the Gentiles there and how it wasn't actually being preached necessarily to the Gentiles there as they were many of the dispersed Jewish believers from Jerusalem who scattered during the persecution were unaware of the fact that, that it was going out to the Gentiles. They were unaware of what happened in um, Caesarea with Cornelius and his family. Uh, most likely they don't even know about the Ethiopian eunuch that Philip ministered to because he did not return to Jerusalem. He was on his way from Jerusalem going back to Ethiopia. And so they're not really aware of this, but as it goes with the Holy Spirit is it's not going to remain um, stagnant or still. And these are faithful believers that were scattered about and they continue to go and, and uh, share and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And probably as there was a decent sized Jewish population in Antioch, probably in the, in the process of proclaiming it to them, there might have been some of the Gentiles, the folks in Antioch that are like, what's this all about? What's going on? And as these were Hellenist Jews, which would be you know, Greek speaking and from Greek lands or Greek occupied lands, um, Jewish people, they would have had a connection linguistically. And as a result, they began say, uh, share, uh, proclaiming the gospel and many came to Christ as we saw. And so we're gonna flip back though as we see that they send um, the Jewish leaders back in Jerusalem, they send Barnabas to Antioch to investigate what's going on. And so we want to flip back to Acts chapter 4, the end of Acts chapter 4 this morning. We'll start at verse 36 there. And as you get over there, let's just turn to the Lord in prayer for a moment as we get started. <clears throat> Holy Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for things that we have already taken for granted this morning, Lord. And we ask that you'd help keep our hearts sensitive to these real-life blessings that you've given to us to be here, to be gathered together this morning, Lord. A privilege to have the facility, to have a roof over our head while it's raining outside, to have... <coughs> AC as it is muggy and humid. You've given us soft chairs to sit on. You've given us the full counsel of God's word in our laps this morning. Father, most of all, you've given us salvation that comes only through Jesus Christ. Through your shed blood on the cross for our sins, made atonement for our sins, that you were treated as if you committed all of the trespasses and sins that we've committed. You impute it to us, your righteousness, so that we in ourselves are not righteous, Lord. We, have, we haven't obtained it. We haven't earned it, Lord, but we have been declared it through your sacrifice, through you taking upon yourself our sin and the wrath of God that was owed to us. You bore it all. And Father, there are folks today that still are condemned, that are still lost in their sins, we pray for them, Lord, because this is for them as well. You don't wish that any should perish. Oh, Lord, break our hearts over this truth, over the power of your word, and strengthen us now, Lord, as we look into your word. Guide us through this time. And Lord, most of all, we thank you for Jesus, our Savior. We also thank you, Lord, for the freedoms we get to enjoy here in this country. As just a couple days from now, we'll be celebrating 4th of July. and We do it today as a family. We don't want to take that for granted. We know that there's a lot of, this nation has a lot of sins, Lord, just like any nation in the world. Lord, I'm grateful that as Christians, our identity isn't first as Americans. It's first as Christians. 
yes, we can be grateful and thankful, and we should be, for where you've given um, or allowed us to be born and raised in, Lord. We, that's one thing none of us chose where we would be born, who we'd be born to, or where. And yet you've blessed us to be born here, in one of the freest nations in the world. Again, we know, Lord, it's not perfect. There's no such thing. Lord, let us use what we've been granted, the freedoms we've been given, to continue to be faithful, to love the lost, to love the people around us, to be praying for them, and to be praying for our nation. In your holy, precious name, Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. So let's read Acts 4, verse 36 and 37. That's not actually right. All right, forget that. Didn't get all the slides updated this morning. But if you have to follow along with me, verse 36 of chapter 4 says, Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Who was Barnabas? Well, we come back to chapter 4 because this is the first time we meet him in Scripture. And did you know his name was Joseph? We usually just think of him as Barnabas, but it was actually Joseph, and he was nicknamed or surnamed by the apostles as, as Barnabas, son of encouragement. That's what it translates into. This is a very fitting name for Barnabas, as, as we have already seen in the book of Acts, how he is a living testimony. He lives up to this name that they've given to him. Names, we know names have meanings, and we know that they have importance even to this day. We choose names for our children based on, many times based on their meanings, but I think it's not quite as, um, the contrast isn't quite there as it once was. In the Middle East and in ancient times, names had a significant meaning. And so this was no small thing that they nicknamed him Barnabas, son of encouragement. Um, and so it's a very fitting name. Additionally, you'll see here that he was a Levite from the, from the tribe of Aaron. He was uh, of the priestly line. And similar to the Apostle Paul, Barnabas is uh, a Jewish man, but he's not from Israel. Saul was Saul of Tarsus, right? It's outside of Israel. And Barnabas is from Cyprus. Cyprus is an island between the coast um, of Syria in Asia Minor. Remember Syria? That's where Antioch is. The city of Antioch is in Syria. And so it, the culturally, they're very um, close. They would have shared a lot of customs. And so that's, that's who Barnabas is in a nutshell. And so what did he do? In verse 37, it tells us that he sold a field. And he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So we see that he's generous. Now, it said that he was a Levite. I want to return to this for just a moment. If you recall back in Numbers uh, 18.20, you don't have to turn there, but it says that um, the tribe of, of Aaron, the Levites, weren't to own land. Um, Numbers 18.20 says, And the Lord said to Aaron, You shall have no inheritance in their land, neither shall you have an, any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. And so those from the tribe of Aaron, who the Levites, were not to own land. So how is it possible that Barnabas was able to sell a field and donate the money? Well, one possibility is that he didn't live in Israel. He lived in Cyprus. And so the law doesn't necessarily prohibit him from having land outside of Israel. Another possibility is that it was his wife's property that he Maybe she inherited uh, in the marriage. And then still another is that in Jeremiah chapter 32, we see God give instructions to Jeremiah to purchase a field from his cousin, uh, Hanuman. Bottom line is, though, it, bottom line, Luke doesn't tell us exactly how or why he had the land, but it's really what he did with what he had. That's what we need to take away. Barnabas sold it and he presented the money to the apostles. He sold a field and generously gave the money by laying it at the apostles' feet. He was not required to do this, but he did this as um, first for the cause of Christ, right? The cause of Christ was first. It was important. 
for Barnabas above any kind of secondary investments that he had in his life. So first for the cause of Christ. What about us? Is the cause of Christ first or is it second in our lives, in our time, in our investments? And I'm not just talking about finances. I realize in this case he sold the field and he presented the money. Um, generously he did this. But, but what about our lives in general? What about our time? What about our, our talents? Do they not belong first to the Lord? For the believer, they do. So do we give to God first? Do we give ourselves first to God and the things of God or to the personal investments that we have? Is he first in your life this morning? Is Christ first in your life? Barnabas was not just a talker, exhorting and encouraging, but he was a doer. We see this in what he did here. It's also interesting to note that Barnabas does, does this at the end of chapter 4, and we all know the event that unfolds at the beginning of chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira, where they did something similar, and many people were. It's not Barnabas wasn't unique. Many were selling and giving of uh, properties and money to the ministry of the church and supporting the believers as well as the ministry going out, providing for the widows and for the orphans. But you have to wonder a little bit if, if why Ananias and Sapphira did what they did. Was it out of, a, were they moved to jealousy or a lust for approval that they saw in Barnabas and others who were doing this from their hearts? You know, Barnabas' motive for his initial act and introduction that we get of him was out of love. His motive was love, love for the Savior, love for for his brethren, love for the ministry. And Ananias and Sapphira, their motive was recognition. It was for themselves. Remember, Peter told them there was no obligation for them to give all the money or to give any of it. They could have said, we're going to give 50% and keep 50%, and they would have glorified and praised the Lord in it. We don't even know what percentage they kept back for themselves, but they, they both agreed together to lie. You cannot lie to God. He's all-knowing. And so they suffered the consequences. God did remove them. They perished. They died for their sin. For, Bar for Barnabas, love is the connecting link. 1 Corinthians 13, 3. We looked at this a few weeks back. As we looked at um, 1 Corinthians 13, the first seven verses. In those first three verses is hyperbole. We talked about that. But it says... If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. So there was nothing for Barnabas to gain in doing this out of a selfish ambition. He did this with a generous, loving heart. 1 John 3.17 says, If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? And then verse 18, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. This is characteristics that we see in Barnabas, a man loving in deed and in truth. Now, how did Barnabas serve? <clears throat> One, by removing difficulties. We move back to Acts chapter 11, where we've been spending our time recently. And you look at verse 22 again, it says, the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. So the news about the conversion of the Gentiles in Antioch has reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And I doubt there was much debate on who to send, as Barnabas has already demonstrated such godly characteristics as an encourager, generous, loving, faithful, and discerning servant. Some have asked why didn't they send the apostles. Well, we don't know. It doesn't say. Maybe the apostles are somewhere else at this time. And as we said last, I think it was last week, we talked about how, well, why didn't they send Peter as the lead apostle? Well, we also said, well, maybe they had concerns that Peter would be biased based on what just had unfolded in Caesarea with Cornelius and his household and the Gentiles coming to faith. Because remember, that was um, that news also traveled back to Jerusalem ahead of Peter. And then he was criticized for eating 
iniquity of the Gentiles. We talked about that a few weeks ago. An interesting thing to note, though, Cornelius was a man that had a reputation, a good reputation with the Jewish people, despite the fact that he was a centurion, a Roman soldier, a mortal enemy, if we could say, of Israel. But he had a good reputation. He was known as a God-fearer and a man who prayed. And so he was somebody that maybe the Jews back in Jerusalem could accept, saying, well, you know, he was seeking the Lord. And if they had news of the Ethiopian eunuch, they also saw a man who was seeking the Lord. But Antioch is different. We talked about how it's second to Corinth as far as debauchery and sinfulness, gambling, bathhouse, bathhouses, racetracks, um, the temples there. And of course, with the temples, the ancient Greek temples came the prostitution and everything else. And so there's all kinds of stuff going on there. There were some other sayings by some historians about it, um, mocking it as, as a cesspool and everything else. But yet it was also a very beautiful city marble paved roads, a main street that went on for over four miles, marble columns that lined the streets. It was the first city in the ancient world to have street lights at night. Um, it was a very modern city in that day. And so they probably saw this as an opportunity for somebody who was from that region, as Barnabas was a um, Cypriot Jew or a Jewish man from Cyprus to be able to connect with the, or having an advantage to be able to connect with the language and the customs. So we know they sent the right man for the job. He's already proven to be a man of encouragement and discernment too. Sometime after Saul's conversion, he travels, Saul travels back to Jerusalem and everyone, not surprisingly, is fearful of him. <clears throat> because all they knew of Saul was, was the one version of him being a persecutor as the man who was going house to house having men and women dragged off to prison for following Christ. And he gives a description of, of himself later in Acts chapter 26 of being one who was, you know, beatings and voting against those for execution. So, I mean, you could even say he was beating and executing folks, even if he wasn't physically doing it. Flip back to Acts chapter 9. We look at verse 27. I might have this one. There we go. Actually, we'll back up to 26. And Luke writes here, And when he had come, being Saul, when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him. For they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. And so when no one else would come alongside the apostle Paul, who was then Saul still, or referred to as Saul, Barnabas did. He had a discerning characteristic. He was bold, discerning, a good judge of character, and able to smooth out difficulties. The church in Jerusalem had confidence in the discerning characteristics of Barnabas. So Barnabas removes difficulties. What about us this morning? Do we remove them, or do we create them? In order for difficulties to be removed, change has to take place. Change doesn't take place without repentance. You know, this week I was thinking about the attributes of God. I was thinking about his immutability. He's this, this unchanging. We know God is immutable. Boy, do we praise God for that. Imagine if he was 99% or even 99.9% .9 unchanging but still had that variation to be able to change. What real hope would we have? Zero. We really would have zero hope because we would have no idea if in the end he was going to actually fulfill what he promised. But he's unchanging. He's a promise-keeping God. Uh, Malachi 3.6, For I, the Lord, do not change. Hebrews 13a, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do you realize that we, as creations, though, as cre creatures, are mutable? Everything in creation is mutable. Everything changes. 
mutates. And that's a good thing too, because imagine if we didn't change, we would still have no hope. Imagine if we didn't grow. I mean, you watch a little baby, they change on a daily basis. You always hear moms say things like that, sometimes dads, but moms pay more attention. How the little changes that happen in little ones day by day by day by day. And it's really quite an amazing thing. But imagine if they didn't. I mean, that would be a little bit strange. And as I was walking home this past week in the morning, I was crossing the bridge over to the Ryle side, our, becoming our little island there because all the bridges seem to be going out, the peninsula, I guess. Um, I was, I was crossing over and I was looking at some of the flowers and there's a tree that blossoms and I don't know the name of it, Rick shared it with me recently, but you'll notice this wonderful fragrance as you walk around. Um, and, and I believe they make perfume from this flower on this tree. And some of, I think Broadway actually has a bunch of these trees. And so if you walk up there in the morning, especially if for some reason it seems stronger in the morning, I don't know. It's just very fragrant, um, just beautiful. And those are some of the things that I am grateful for that change in creation. Now we get to see the seasons and we get to see the bloom of, of the flowers and the, and the smell that just permeates the air. I guess if you have really bad flower allergies, you may not appreciate it as much, <laughs> but, um, but it's still a beautiful smell. And it's, you know, I'm always thinking when I first started smelling them, I was always thinking somebody was around somewhere wearing you know, perfume, really strong perfume. You know, sometimes they leave a trail and you can still smell it for yards afterwards. But it was, uh, I realized it was those trees and it's just really nice smell. And I'm grateful for those changes in nature. It reminds me of how blessed I am that I am no longer a hopeless, lost sinner. I'm certainly still a sinner, make no mistake about it. I sin every day, whether I want to or not, I do. But I am no longer a slave to sin as I once was. I am no longer bound to that old man, that deathly corpse of a being I once was because of the change of Christ in my life. And all believers have this. And so we, again, we say we praise the Lord that we as creatures are mutable. I'm so thankful I'm no longer having to do the things I once did. I'm so thankful for the changes that the Lord continues to do in my life and in the lives of believers everywhere. And I am sure of this, Paul writes in Philippians 1.6, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So we also know that he will finish that work he has started on all of his, all those who are believers. We take confidence in that. God is faithful to what he says he will do. Now here's the thing. Barnabas saw the change that took place in Saul. But maybe some, some of it stemmed from Barnabas' own conversion when he considered how Christ worked and changed him. We don't know. But he saw it in Paul, and God used that discernment to bring him into fellowship with the rest of the believers there. Now, sometimes I think, though, we try to be immutable. We know we can't be. We know we aren't. We can't stop time even, you know. See a few more gray hairs each morning, maybe a, a wrinkle or two. Those things, despite all of our efforts, don't really stop. <laughs> we don't want things to change. We want things to carry on the church or in our home or in our place of work unchanged sometimes. We don't like it when someone new comes into, into the group, maybe. Maybe there's other areas of challenge that we're faced with, maybe a different order of things. And so sometimes we can try to be immutable in the sense that we don't want to change with things that we like. Even more seriously, we don't want to change regarding some of our, our favorite sins. Imagine if the Jewish believers in Jerusalem remained unchanged about the Gentiles being saved. Imagine if Peter remained unchanged and refused to go to Cornelius? What if Christian leaders went right on refusing Saul and excluding him from their circle? Well, what about us? Are there areas where we are unwilling to change, yield to the Lord, 
or whatever that looks like. Maybe we're not, so we're looking at Barnabas and we're thinking of encouragement and how he encouraged believers. Maybe we don't, we'll say about ourselves, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from New York. We're, we're not big on encouraging people. We just kind of say what's on our mind and we go about things. Well, is that what Christ did? Is that how Christ lived? Is that the example he leaves for us? You know, yeah, we do have elements and um, God makes each of us unique and he gives us different personalities. We see that in scripture. We see it with Peter had his own personality. Paul had his own personality. That, that's not something we need to be a cookie cutter. But can we be more encouraging? Can we have more of a ministry of encouragement like Barnabas? So moving on now, flip back over to chapter 11. We look at verse 23. It says, when he came and saw, this is Barnabas, when he came to Antioch and he saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Barnabas is helping believers. Barnabas was helping believers in their new life and new walk with their Savior, Jesus Christ. New believers need a lot of encouragement, just like a baby needs a lot of encouragement. This doesn't mean we, we come alongside them and tell them everything they need to do or say, or even worse, maybe we try to do it for them. But you just sit there. We'll, we'll take care of this for you. You know, if we're not careful, what we'll end up doing is making, we'll be force feeding people our opinions and making them to be more like us rather than like Christ. It's very fitting that Brother Greg read Romans chapter 14 regarding the weaker and the stronger brothers and our opinions. And so we do need to come along and encourage people. That doesn't mean we do everything or we tell them to be exactly this way. We show them what Scripture says. We show them what God's word says about certain things, we um, learn how to answer those and direct them and come alongside them and encouraging them to be like Christ. That's the goal all for all of us is to be like Christ. You know, I was thinking about this too. They talk about how children who are encouraged at young ages, um, they just do better, whether it's in school or work or there's lots of places, but there's also... Uh, a misunderstanding of praising and encouraging. Sometimes praising is when we we put our opinion. Well, we like that because of, and so therefore they they start to um, learn how to do the things that make mom and dad happy, or teacher happy, or professor happy, or boss happy, rather than being encouraged to to grow and to uh, mature in their own walk and learn how to do things. <coughs> and so we want to encourage yes we do want to uplift and, and build up and, and give thanks and praises where it's needed but we want to encourage people to keep going that to you know to keep being faithful to the word word of god and to the truth and so he's there he's helping believers and he's doing it by praising god it says he was glad well remember in the greek word it's more of a it's a stronger word it means he he was exceedingly joyful he was exceedingly overwhelmed with with gratitude to the lord for the work that he was doing there and then he exhorted or encouraged them he came alongside them to remain faithful barnabas arrives in antioch he sees the grace of god in the lives of the gentiles and is exceedingly joyful over the development so he does what he does best he comes alongside them and encourages them to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. There's so much more we could say, but moving on, verse 24, it says, For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. He's winning souls. Now, it's interesting when you read Scripture, sometimes it goes from one verse to the next verse to the next verse, and it's almost as if Barnabas shows up, by the way, 300 miles north of Jerusalem, so it's not a short trip that he made to get there. And it's almost as if he walks in and he's like, oh, hey, what's going on? All right, great. Oh, you, praise the Lord. You guys are doing great. Keep doing it. And then he goes off to Tarsus to get Paul or Saul. But actually, there's more time that's, you know, he's, he's going to get to the city. Then he's got to find out where these, these believers are. Um, and he meets with them and he and converses with them. 
and he sees the grace of God in their lives. And so there's, there's some development going on here. There's some time spent, but it's just, when you read it, sometimes it just goes boom. It's just giving you the highlights and moving right through. But it says there at the end of verse 24, and a great many people were added to the Lord. And so he continues, he wins souls for Christ. He's encouraging them. He is proclaiming the gospel and he's seeing more and more. Um, in Dr. Luke chronological fashion, we see another mountain peak of souls being saved. As it says, a great many were added, people were added to the Lord. But there's more to unpack in this verse regarding the character of Barnabas. See, there's a stream. He's a good man. What does Luke call, excuse me, why does Luke call Barnabas good? Doesn't he know what Jesus himself said when addressed by the title good teacher? After all, Luke actually wrote that, that uh, account in Luke 18, 18, you know, where he says, why do you call me good? None's good but God. No one is good except God alone. And so why does Luke do this? Well, the answer is in the words immediately following. Barnabas is full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. It's not his own goodness, just like it's not our righteousness. It's God's. It's the goodness of God. It's the characteristics that we see, the Christ-like characteristics we see in Barnabas, that he gets this title. In other words, Barnabas had the spirit of Jesus Christ within him, and he had faith, which is a fruit of the spirit. Galatians 5.22, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He was exhibiting these things. Barnabas was rejoicing because the spirit in him was bearing witness with the spirit that was within the Gentile converts. They were rejoicing with one another. And so the stream of a good man flowed through Christ in him. What we need today is less witty, charismatic, and clever men and more good men and women, godly, good. A good in a godly way, I should say. Of ourselves, there is no goodness except for Christ who resides within us. And so the source, Barnabas, was full of the Holy Spirit, like those seven faithful servants back in Acts chapter 6. Stephen, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, um, Parmenaeus, and Nicolaus. <clears throat> Those seven men were, said they were full, complete. The source was the Holy Spirit. The source for this stream of godly characteristics that we've seen in Barnabas is the Holy Spirit. His generosity, his sympathy, his clear-sightedness self-forgetfulness and self-sacrifice are you relying on yourself to be the source or you'll be disappointed and it will fail or is the source that flows out of you from the holy spirit in your life your relationship with christ and next the secret he's full of faith Without faith in Christ alone for salvation, you will not have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Faith is the victory, as the old hymn says. Faith admits trust in Christ. Its dependence on him are undertaken. Independence of him are relinquished. Surrender to Christ is sustained in faith. Hindrance to him is removed. Faith leads to obedience in Christ. Willing to do his will, prepared to do his work. Will you take God at his word? And we wrap up this morning as we are going to take some time to go to the Lord's table in just a few minutes. It's not every believer can be like Peter and John, but we can all be like Barnabas and having a ministry of encouragement. Do you have a ministry of encouragement? Are you looking to be encouraged by others or are you looking to encourage others first thessalonians 5 11 therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you're doing keep doing it ephesians 4 29 let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear Proverbs 12, 25, 
anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. Boy, there are anxieties in a lot of folks' hearts these days, not the least of believers. I was with a man this past week, and a believing man, and he, he mentioned to me, and, and as he was saying, it was one of those moments where, was, where as he was stating it, he realized the error of what he was saying, but he had kind of believed that a true Christian shouldn't have any anxiety. And I just pointed him to David. You know, we see David was, <laughs> he was hunted <laughs> by King Saul. He was on the run. He was an enemy. I mean, he had all kinds of problems. And we see it. He didn't hide it. He leaves it in the, the Psalms for us, which is the divinely inspired word of God. But I said, one thing we can draw away is his response when it happened. It might not have been right away. We know he delayed dealing with the sin that he had with Bathsheba for a while. But what he did respond, and when he did, he went where? To prayer. He went back to the Lord in repentance. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. But a good word makes him glad. Do we tend to bring more anxiety to brothers and sisters, or do we bring them a good word of encouragement, and love? Do we want to receive, 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 give, 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 or do we want to, to uh, or take, take, take? I should say, or do we want to give? And so, challenge us. And I'll ask this question again: Do you have a ministry of encouragement? Are you looking to be encouraged, or are you looking to? encourage others this time we're gonna um, go to the lord in prayer for a few moments